Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the 35th International Film Fest Dresden. It's very nice to see so many of you here on that s very sunny and very warm Saturday afternoon. Um, and uh, you probably won't regret it. It's a very uh, good investment of one and a half hours um, because we're going to talk about wasting time. Uh, this afternoon, the art of wasting time, I shall say. And um, we have someone here who's been doing that for quite a while, uh, wasting time. Um, Fayaz Jafri, um, who is an artist, uh, composer, um, many different things, a self-taught animator, um, new media artist, curator, educator, um, based between New York and, and Montreal. Um, originally from the Netherlands of Pakistani descent. And um, welcome, welcome. Um, and uh, his works have been exhibited in all the different forms you can imagine, um, in print and paintings, video installations, um, films, of course, um, and also sculptures. And what his work is exactly exploring, I'm sure you'll you'll talk about um, in a bit, but uh, it's very much about exploring um, the abysses of our time, I shall say, and the the pop culture that we are consuming every day. And uh, Fayaz is going to talk about um, trying to get out of this cycle that, for some reason, our our system of, of capitalism and productivity is trying to impose on us. Um, so it's going to be a very, very political talk without being explicitly political. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to uh, waste much more minutes <laughs> um, and uh, leave the floor to you, um, Fayas, and then we're going to have a chance to chat about your, your work and presentation afterwards and obviously for you to join into the conversation. Um, thank you, Vincent. Uh, thank you, Dresden, for having me. This is the first festival I've been back at since the pandemic. I was very reluctant to come out to a festival, um, since the p but I, I was, I'm very happy I'm here. I'm very humbled by everybody here coming to listen to me talk about uh, my work and the art of wasting time. Um, so I want to talk today about two things, really. Uh, I want to talk about the creative process and how it relates to me, but how I think it relates to the creative process in general. And I want to talk about the evolution of the use of time. Um, and so I'm going to talk and I'm going to show you some films and I'm going to talk more and then show you a film. Um, so I'm going to start with a film.
Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, just a very quick um, housekeeping note that I forgot to mention in the beginning. Um, because we are in this very tight space, um, if everyone could switch their phone on flight mode so that we um, minimize the chances of interferences with the microphones, that would be wonderful. Thanks. All right. So the art of wasting time. Um, that is what I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a step back. Um, for people who do not know my work that well or not at all, um, these are sort of the three things that I have been, uh, I guess, posing when it comes to when I talk about my work. Uh, Neo-archetypes, hyper-unrealism, and digital dialect. So neo-archetypes is really something that is, it's something that I, that I, invented, and uh, I'll explain it a little bit more later on, but um, what I was trying to do when I started making films, or I guess as long as I've been making art, is to tell stories, or to, but to tell, some, to, to, to tell something that is legible, but not necessarily comprehensible. I'm not interested in trying to guide you and tell you exactly what you have to feel or think or get out of it, um, but I do want to play with, with a comprehensibility and, uh, and, and neo-archetypes come into play in there. It's based on Jung archetypes, and it will, I will evaluate on that a little bit more. And, and hyperrealism is really this style, and, and hyperrealism is really just digital dialect, or I should say, digital materiality. And it's really about, instead of hiding the fact that we're using CGI, showing it and showing its imperfections, but also um, its uniqueness, um, um, which is something that I teach at some schools as well in New York. Um, and, and digital dialect is really, instead of a visual language, I feel that instead of trying to really communicate in words, I'd rather speak in tongues, if you will, in, in, in the digital realm. So those are the three things that sort of are part of, uh, of what I, um, how I started really by making films. Um, and you'll see that over the progress of my film, of the work I'm showing, although the first film was a more recent one, uh, it, it's, it, it, it goes in a more, I guess, it distances itself even more from that comprehensibility. And so, um, go back to the, um, the neo-archetypes here. So the, the, uh, we have this thing called the collective unconscious, right? And, and Jung po posed this. And uh, the idea, if you want to tell stories that everybody can understand, you would have to write a story using archetypal characters. And, uh, in, and it, this is something they do in Hollywood because these films will make the most money because they have the largest uh, target audience, etc. Which is not particularly interesting per se, right? And, uh, but I'm, I am interested in sort of this common knowledge and this common idea of things that we share with one another. This, this little boy is, 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 you know, is built, has this built-in ROM chip of, of these archetypes, the father, the mother, pain, war, what have you, the hero, etc. right? Um, but neo-archetypes are sort of a sort of a, an extension of that. They're, they're built on the same principle. So the idea is that instead of uh, having these things, you know, part of our uh, of humanity as we are born, because of the internet and the amount of data that we have created and the amount of information that we share with each other on such a massive basis, is that there is really little obscurity and a lot of things that we uh, that we talk about are references to our popular media, our popular culture, right? Um, a great example is memes, right? If something comes out on, on a television show, uh, it, it gets modified, it gets, uh, it, 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 it there's, there, there's text put upon it, uh, it's referencing back its intertextuality on steroids, if you will, right? And, um, and so thinking about that, instead of using the traditional archetypes, which are very Western, white, culture driven, I thought it was more interesting to look at a whole, at, you know, at, 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 our, uh, at our experience of popular media, right? And you can see here there is a combination of, you know, of three of these popular culture media, right? Um, so this is sort of, the collective unconscious doesn't change, right? It's like, it's very, uh, it's, it's very, in a way, it is what it is, right? And, and, and um, it doesn't really grow much. And you also see that a lot of these stories that are being told that way are sort of becoming a little stale because we know them, right? But what is interesting, in my opinion, is, is what is happening in the popular unconscious, right? This is where we share information with one another, right? This is where these neo-archetypes live, and they keep growing. Right, there's more and more coming, and they mutate. Right, there's a, a meme that gets then changed around, and then that meme gets me memeified in itself, and etc. Right, and it happens at such a high speed, and, um, and 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 in such a way that we can sort of communicate without actually using real words. We're using, you know, you know again, intertextuality on uh, on steroids. Right, 
So example, right? Everybody knows who this character is, right? And yes, it is a typical Jungian archetype, but it's also so much more, right? It's Luke's father, he breeds weirdly, right? He, uh, he, he was a good man and then he wasn't a good man, he wears a black suit, right? For some reason, this represents a lot uh, more than just that, right? And everybody on the planet, maybe that's not completely true, but quite a lot of people on the planet know who this guy is, or this person, or this character is. Even if you don't like Star Wars, if you hate a bit of passion, you've never seen any of these films, you probably have seen this character somewhere around, right? Same with this one, right? The, the, uh, the evil queen from, uh, from um, Snow White. Of course, the apple, right? Uh, archetypal, maybe not, but biblical, right? And, and all the connotations that come with that, right? Now, if you start mixing these together, you get something that is what I call, you know, a neo-archetype, right? Or it's, it's, it's sort of a composite of a neo-archetype, right? It's familiar, but it's not exactly familiar, right? So everybody will have a different idea of what it could be, what it means, right? And based on that, I find it interesting to tell stories, right? So I, I use these, these pop references as a visual shorthand to, to tell stories. Um, and it's interesting because if you go back in history, this is a film from the 30s, you cannot think for, you know, for, for like maybe half a second, hey, that's Darth Vader. No, it's not. It's not Darth Vader. Uh, you know, maybe George Lucas copied this, right? But it's, it, once it's there and set in us, uh, it's very hard to step away from it, to think away from that. I mean, I, I'm assuming that everybody knows where I'm going with this, right? Right. So if you do that, then you totally understand this, right? This, this is to right? This is what I. This, this is how we communicate in a very, uh, in a very visual way, which in a way is a way more human way, right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you this film. This is uh, from, I think it's almost 15 years old, um, and it's really just embracing all of this, this, this concept of the neo archetypes. This is really that. That I guess the epiphany of, of, of that concept. So uh, I'm going to play you this movie now.
Thank you. All right, so the creative process, right? So I've been thinking about this, um, what it actually is. I've been, so, you know, you start making art and you don't really think about it, you do it all by intuition. You start thinking about, you know, first time you have to write a synopsis, you have to talk about your work and then you have to put it into words. And so I've been thinking about what that creative process is and what that means. And what I really realized when talking to a lot of artists is that the creative process is a really painful process. And that most artists, even the successful ones that go on stage and talk like, you know, they're in full control, they're not, right? And um, I kind of love that about artists. Um, and so I think this diagram here sort of describes what it is to be an artist. And it, I guess it's a spectrum, right? But um, there's this, 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 this thing, you're a visual artist, you're an artist, right? You're not an artist because you don't think what you have to say is important, right? There's, most of them, most of you of artists really think, at least you gotta believe that what you have to say or what you're making is worthwhile for other people to look at. Maybe even if it's just your cat, but you can just, right? Um, and so you gotta sort of bounce in between that, right? There is this idea that if, if you don't think that you are amazing, right, and you don't tell yourself that, it's gonna be really hard because a lot of times nobody else tells you that, right? You might get an accolade here or there, right? But a lot of times you're by yourself and you need to bring yourself up, right? But as you're doing that, you also need to go back and, 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 and question everything at the same time. You gotta sort of bounce in between that, or at least I think you should do that, right? There are artists that are always on the left side, right? And most of them are, you know, they're usually very successful, but they're also sort of one-trick ponies, in my opinion. And there's artists here which make beautiful work, but it never comes out into the world. And I think the best way is to go back and forth, because art is created right there. I am amazing, but this is not good. I need to be better. And that inner dialogue in there, uh, which is extremely painful, also makes it super exciting and always dynamic. Um, this is not mine, I found this online. Um, so the creative process, even if you have a deadline or you don't have a deadline, because in your head, the deadline is finishing your piece, um, it starts a lot of time with procrastination or not doing anything, right? And the idea uh, that if you are an artist and you're creating stuff, the only time that you feel that you are valuable is when you're actually doing something you can show or that is tangible, right? But that idea of not doing anything, that procrastination has always been, oh, I'm procrastinating, you know, you feel guilty, you feel shit, you feel like, oh, I should be doing something else, right? Uh, we get to panicking point and we do all the work while crying and then trying to do it better next time. And what I usually tell my students is like, this doesn't change. And if you're doing it right as an artist, it shouldn't change. The only thing that changes is that you actually understand the phases you're going through and you get very comfortable with that. But procrastination is an extremely, extremely important part of the creative process. It is the part where you mull over, because you're not doing nothing, right? You're not doing anything tangible, but you're thinking and you're, m you're, 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 you're planting seeds in your head and they're fermenting and they get stinky and disgusting and sometimes a beautiful flower comes out of it and then you kill that flower. But it's super important to get that, right? And so the idea of going through that phase and just let it be while still feeling shit about it, right, is very important. And the thing is, I, I, I talk about this quite often these days and I still forget it, right? I, I, like I have my partner telling me, you procrastinate it's okay, I'm like, okay. Or it's the process, or whatever, whatever the word is that brings me down again, right? So procrastination is extremely important. And I think this is something that is very uh, under, uh, this, this is not what, they don't teach you this in art school. There's always a deadline, right? And you need to be graded and all that stuff, right? And of course, a lot of times when you are procrastinating, this is what happens, right? Which is even better because you're doing so much work when you're procrastinating in your head or you know, on pieces of paper that you throw away, or you know, movie files or digital files that get lost in a tra trash can. But yes, this is the way. There is no other way for the creative process. The other inner turmoil, and it sort of goes back to being a narcissist and being super, come on in. Um, uh, being a narcissist, but also being completely in full of doubt, right? When you do a, you have a great new idea, or you have a project, or whatever it is, this is amazing, you know, it's gonna be your best piece, et cetera, et cetera, then you realize it's not that easy, you need to work a little harder on it. 
And you get to the point like this is all crap and shit and you know you don't even know what to do with yourself anymore. But then you get to part four. Part four is very important. This is where you think you are shit because your work is shit. And the important part of that is, is that if you ever get to this point, you are an artist. I didn't call myself an artist for a very long time because well, I didn't go to art school and I didn't know if that what that really meant. And it's really the only, the only time you become an artist is when you declare yourself as one, right? But this is a very important part. You identify with who you are. You are your art, then you're an artist, right? That shitty feeling that you are so worthless because what you do is so terrible, you're on the right path, right? And it, it, then it goes here and then it goes there, right? Come fight me after class if you, <laughs> if you, if you, if you disagree. Um, so basically happy shit, right? <laughs> I am the shit, but I'm also shit at the same time. You go back and forth between that. Um, and so this identifying with your work of who you are reminded me a little bit of Franz Kafka's um, The Metamorphosis, right? Where Gregor Samsa wakes up one morning and he is a cockroach or he's a bug. And his main concern is not that he is a cockroach, it's like, how do I get to work and pay my bills, right? And, and I had something similar a couple of years ago where I woke up one morning and I started to see double and uh, I had a weird neurological disorder uh, for nine months where I saw double. One of my eyes I lost control of and just moved, moved in and I couldn't really work. And I wasn't really worried about dying or you know, having all um, uh, MS or Lyme disease or whatever. I was like, how the hell am I gonna make my films? I'm a visual artist, this is horrible, right? And so that existential crisis came right there. And this is also one of those moments in life, like, hey, you're an artist, man, there's no way around it. There's, you're not gonna do anything else, right? And so yeah, I am the cockroach, I guess. Who am I if I cannot procrastinate elaborately, right? All right. So the other thing that is going on in my work these days is the evolution of the use of time. I'm already I was already playing with story, or not story, but uh, I guess with, with emotional uh, journeys, I will say, right? Because I don't really want to tell a story. And I think Hello Bermuda, that your show still has a very clear story, right? Um, but it's not conventional, and um, it was definitely not made conventional, right? But the evolution of the use of time, and, and really what it, 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 it is about um, going into sort of the idea of stepping away from, from film conventions, right? And from uh, production conventions, if you will, right? Um, I was reading this book by Paul Schrader. Um, he, writes, he, wrote, he wrote a book about transcendental cinema, right? And he talks about how uh, the, the around the 60s, people started breaking away from uh, from traditional film rules, right? Rules were they were very strict, right? You could not go from a wide shot to a close up. You had to do a medium shot in between that, right? Shot reverse shot. What am I looking at, right? French New Wave started breaking that, right? Deleuze wrote a whole whole book about it when he wrote his cinema books, right? Um, and so I was like, this is interesting because I think that is what I want to do. And I guess this is what I want to start doing, making long, boring animated films within the short film format. Uh, yeah. And I w there was a film in the festival uh, this year that totally spoke to me because I feel that this artist know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, So this is really what happens, right? So Paul Schrader talks about this in his book, Transcendental uh, uh, Cinema. Um, but then um, in his, um, in his foreword, or uh, in, in the new edition that came after Deleuze wrote his cinema books, he, he actually understood much better what he was writing when he was a young man, right? So it's like we go from Aristotle's unified plot and the traditional story structures, right? And we go into Deleuze. We're, we're going to withholding techniques, right? I, I, the director would take you by the hand, say, look at this, now look at that, now look at this, right? Man walks out of a room, we instantly cut to the man walking into the room, right? And that's it, right? Uh, if you would look at a film like Ozu, a lot of times he would just do a pillow shot. All of a sudden you see a teapot, right? Whoa, what happens? Oh, now all of a sudden you are very much aware you're watching a film, right? You are not being sort of, uh, the wool is not pulled over your eyes anymore and you're not being, con you know, you're not being uh, diluted or diluted that you are in, in a fantasy world, right? It's a, the sensory motor break, right? It is now, now it is not about the things that we expect that we have seen so often 
a language of film that we totally understand. We don't have to read. We, we don't have to go to school for that, right? We un understand the jump cut. We understand. Oh, this is happening at the same time. Oh, that is that is what that person is looking at. Yeah. Very quickly, we learned all of that, and we didn't go to school for that. Most of us, right? Well, maybe here we all went to school for that. But and it's like time pressure, right? Tarkovsky talks about it, where everything, it's not about the, uh, it's not about the cut to the edit, it's what's happening in, st in the frame, in the scene, right? You remember the first film that I showed you, that's one, it's like nothing is happening. Well, there's a lot happening, but nothing is happening. But I bet you everybody at some point was maybe getting a little bit uncomfortable, but your eyes started wandering around the screen. You started looking around. You are very much aware that you now are watching a film, right? You are experiencing watching a film instead of being guided to what to see, right? It's what they call the democracy of the eye, and I'm all for that, right? I didn't make that up. I think uh, uh, scholars of Bazin call it, call it that. Um, I think that's a, it's a lovely term, right? But it also brings you into this, right? It also takes more of an effort for you as an audience. I know that. All right, I'm going to show you another film that plays with that. I made this in... 2021, um, I shot it on location in Montreal, and I did most of the production also in Montreal, and some of it in New York. All right, let's have a look at this.
Right, so I guess there's sort of a paradigm shift in where um, there is really a step away from narrative completely. Um, extremely underwhelmed by Freitag already for a very long time. And I really think it's, to me, I find this more interesting to play with the medium as is and to create an experience that is an emotional experience that is that is going to guide you, right? It's, I'm not following all the rules of slow cinema or transcendental cinema or even stasis films. Um, um, but it, it is, you know, there is, it, what what is in common with all these other things is that it's playing with time and the evolution of time and taking time and stretching time also maybe even in daily life when you think you only have five minutes you can do a shitload of work in five minutes right and you can waste a lot of time in five hours uh, so the ideas of time is something that uh, i guess this is i guess this direction that i'm going in right now right okay i'm gonna segue a bit i'm gonna come back to this but um and so trauma right so in 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 as an artist, right, a lot of times finding inspiration, finding things, you know, finding ideas of what you want to do uh, is not that easy, right? Um, and so um, trauma is always something that, one, it's hard, right? It's something you're going to have to deal with. It's something you're going to carry along with, with you for the rest of your life. But it is also, uh, art can be extremely cathartic in just expressing it, right? It's like, it's, it's like therapy by yourself in a way, right? You can express your suffering or your ideas about what happened to you uh, um, based on the trauma, right? This is uh, the uh, September 11. This is the World Trade Center from around the corner. Uh, I'm going to get back to that in a second. I believe that... As a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. So I, f I found this, uh, this, this, this long monologue by Agent Smith from The Matrix where he says, you know, he did, we're talking about The Matrix, we made this beautiful world, but it didn't work because human beings rejected it because it wasn't real enough. And he says that as human, you know, this we, we define our reality through misery and suffering. And I think that is kind of true. I think if there is not really any suffering or hardship, um, I don't think we believe it's real life. I'm not saying that it's great to suffer, but I think you need that in order to feel alive, right? And you'll, um, and, and for some reason, it always comes back to that. And there's again that, that inner dialogue if you were an, when you're an artist, right? The time when you're procrastinating and thinking, it's suffering. Why do you do this stuff? Why don't you just, you know, go be an Uber drive or something, right? Um, so if you, so I was thinking about, you know, the, the mental, mental, mental illness, uh, anxiety. Uh, I'm not diagnosed with everything, anything, but I'm pretty sure that I'm on the spectrum on a bunch of things, right? I suffer from depression. I suffer from insecurity. I suffer from anxiety. I'm always fidgeting, right? Um, but it's interesting that Aristotle, who we have, you know, departed from because we don't do his plot anymore, right, said that being depression is part of, be, you know, is, uh, depression is part of being being a creative, right? And um, for some reason, I found solace in that, right? It's like the idea of it, it is part of my of the creative process. So embracing that, I guess, a lot of it is becoming to understand who you are and what is it is to be an artist and how that how that uh, um, how that is basically a, a way of life. Even Chuck Jones thinks that way. Okay. Art is suffering, and that's okay. I think that's really what it is. And I think this dog really well re represents that. Right. So for a long time, I was trying to find a diagram, or because you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, and I like schematics and clean things. So um, I was trying to find a way of visualizing the creative process. And I think two weeks ago, I finally found it. I knew that if you're creating, you're more happy, but if you're more happy, you also become less creative usually because you don't have to, right? It's like it's the, you don't need the help anymore, if you will, right? But then I was like, that's not completely true because sometimes when I create and I'm happy, I want to be more happy because I'm greedy, so I create more, right? But sometimes when I'm happy, I procrastinate. I'm totally okay with that because now I know that it is okay. And so, Sometimes I procrastinate, I'm not happy, right? And then I create again, and then I get happy. So I started connecting all these things. I'm like, I think this is what it is. And it's like, it's not as, it's not as circular as I thought it was originally, like, you know, sort of like a loop. 
but it sort of is a path that you can take in all kinds of directions. So, well, to me, this makes total sense. I, this is sort of how I live my life on a, on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. And um, I can now say I'm, I'm stuck in this loop or I'm this loop, right? That is a very happy creative loop. That is a very happy useless, workless loop. You don't do a little stuff there, but who cares? You're happy, right? This is horrible. You're procrastinating and you're not happy. That's just, you know, that don't go there, right? And, and sometimes you create and you're not happy. That also happens. That's, that's really weird or uncomfortable. Maybe you should do something else then. Maybe you're not doing the right work or you, you, know, you work for other people maybe. So then you need to come out of that as well, right? So, um, all right. So, yeah, I, th I think this, I need to make probably, yeah, I think this works, yeah, for me at least. All right, okay, so back to this. So um, I was born in Holland, right? Uh, I'm half Dutch, half Pakistani. Um, I was always the brown boy. Um, and so I moved to New York because that was the only place where it didn't matter what the color of my skin was because everybody was different, right? And everybody spoke English in a different way, in a funny way, including myself. And so I, li I moved to New York in 98 and I felt very much at home. I was like, this is my home. Right, so one morning on September 11, um, my mother keeps calling me, ask, you know, and, and it's annoying because I was celebrating my birthday, I was on a weekly bender, and um, I was hungover as hell, and after 10 times having the phone ring, I pick it up, she's like, are you okay, are you guys okay? So I turned on the television, and I saw this happening. So I moved up, I, I'm, I was living downtown in New York, I went to the, the roof of my, uh, of my apartment building at the time, and I watched the two towers smoking away, and I was like, oh, they'll fix that, it's no big deal, right? It's New York, they can, it happened before, there was, a, they had a bombing before there, right? We're indestructible. And of course, five seconds later, this one of these towers just in front of me just implodes, and just goes into rubble, and instantly the world changed. It was also the world, the end of postmodernism, right? It sort of, it bookends the end of postmodernism right there, right? Um, and I went into survival mode and, um, you know, I, I, fe I felt I, I was really, I was pretty messed up because of this, right? Um, I, uh, I slept on the streets, um, drank way too much, and I honestly half the time had no idea where I was. Uh, I was very unproductive as well, right? And um, I was also extremely embarrassed by this. Like, you know, there's places in the world where this stuff happens every day. You know, here I am, you know, fairly happy life, lovely parents, right? Never to worry about money, in, in not so much at least, right? Uh, and here I am all traumatized because something like this happened in my backyard. Of course, it was not just something, right? But I felt that I, um, yeah, I felt very pathetic. Um, so this, th I carried this along with me for a long time. And um, it was not until I moved to Hong Kong for a while, um, when I um, when I was commissioned, this was 2015, uh, and I lived in Hong Kong for four years, um, and um, a film festival in Denver commissioned me to make a piece to be shown outdoor in Denver on these LED screens. I'm like, this is the perfect time to tell this story that how I want to tell it, right? So I wanted to tell a story about the September 11 attacks, or I just wanted to I wanted to visualize it, what it was for me, right? And it was a lot of things for me, but what it really was, was that repetition of the imploding towers. I only saw the first tower come down, but after the first month in New York, every television station that you saw would show another angle of the towers coming down, right? It was imprinted and spoon-fed on a daily basis. You would go to a restaurant, to a bar, you would be outside in front of a, of, of a store, they would show it over and over again. So for me, it was really important to put that into the film, right? Um, it was a w you know it was a weird time the conspiracy theories why did they come down I was angry um, but I also totally understood why it happened right I think the people who died didn't deserve it but the country deserved it right in a way and it was very um, it, it, I, I felt very ambiguous about that um, and so I um, I, I made I made this film um, I don't know if I'm gonna have to do it. Oh, okay I'm gonna play it in a second um, so. It is, it is about how I experienced the collapse of the World Trade Center. And it is also about sort of how the media dealt with it afterwards, or how the United States dealt with it afterwards, right? I'm not a US, I'm a US citizen now, but I'm originally from Holland. So for me, the way they were dealing with it was like a bunch of, it, you know, when a bully gets hit, they start crying. That's exactly what it felt like for me. You know, it's like after three weeks, you're like, let's go through the healing process and forget that this all happened, right? Let's Disneyfy the crap out of this. Let's make it something like, you know, a learning uh, experience, right? And the language that was thrown at us was so, 
vapid that I I I I started using these whole these these Disney characters. I used Thumper is in there as the one who makes brings the towers down. There's Mickey Mouse as the savior, Bambi as the victims. Um, it was all they Disney fight, if you will. This, the narrative of this. And that's, I think, one of the things that really, really annoyed me more than anything else. All right, let me play the film. It's a whole new world and nobody cares. It's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. It's a whole new world and nobody cares. It's a whole new world.
so I'll talk about trauma. I guess the next big thing that happened, or happened to all of us all over the world, was this, right? And this was also, of course, this was the time when, as an animator, and, and I think it was memefied into oblivion that nothing much changed because you spent most of your time behind your computer by yourself anyway, right? Um, I guess what really changed is that I wouldn't go to festivals anymore. So I didn't really have that 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 sort of that that dimension of being among peers, uh, in that who co well, everybody comes out of their caves and then hang out for a week. Um, and so, what I realized that this what the I, the seed when it, you know of the way I started thinking about time, the evolution of the use of time, came out of the experience from COVID, where everything slowed down and everything was empty for a long time. I, I was stuck in Montreal for six months. I, I, moved, I went to Montreal two days before they shut the schools and uh, we were online uh, 24 hours later and uh, I wasn't sure if I could go back to US and didn't wasn't sure I had to go into quarantine. So I stayed in, in, in Montreal for about six months and, um, and really started thinking about what it means uh, th th this this luxury of time that you have, right? And, if, and, and, and the importance and also the stretching of time, I guess, right? Um, I started thinking I wanted to make films that sort of more, there, was, there were more feelings. And I also just wanted to make films more like you would make a painting. Like you would just like go to a canvas and throw something on there and see what happens, right? So um, in, instead of having an idea, because I don't write scripts or storyboards or any of that, I just started, to, I would take some pieces of music and some, some clips that I had and just throw it in an edit line and start putting things together and see if something sticks. And if this sticks, then okay, then and build from there. And and this is really how uh, I, I want to make everything, and this is how I've been doing it for a while now, and this is probably going to go further and further. Um, and so um, this is a film that I made also in 2021, at the beginning of 2021, so this was not, uh, we were still in the pandemic, I guess, right? Um, this is uh, Montreal wintertime, uh, I think this is Villemar, and there, I think we're walking on ice. Uh, I'm working with my girlfriend here, and I was just recording this. Um, um, and I guess I was also teaching uh, three post-production for for students. And um, I guess because I was teaching this, I figured maybe I can use this in my own films. Um, you know, this like this teaching and art practice are all intertwined and infor informing each other all the time. So um, I want to. I also don't write synopsi anymore. This for this film. This this is a haiku that I wrote. This is this is the synopsis for the film. Are you okay? Uh, that I wanna wanna play for you. So again, it's about the democracy of the eye, right? Don't forget, it's okay to wander around. It's okay to fall asleep, right? There um, there are there are long films made, uh, stasis films made by uh, by Yoko Ono and Andy Warhol, right? They're so long, they're eight hours, right? Uh, or Bella Tarr makes these movies too, but uh, th these films by Andy Warhol were just about come come and have a look for half an hour and then go away for dinner and come back again. We'll be here still, right? It's a different experience of film. And I, I think that is, I, I find that interesting. I love sitting in a cinema looking at, at, at movies. That's not what it is. But I like it to be more than just that. There is more, there is more to the medium than that. And I think, I think that if um, I think we're stuck, or I feel that a lot of the a lot of filmmakers um, uh, are stuck in in a structure that we can break away from because you feel like you need to do that because you feel like an audience expects that, and I guess um, I want I want to play with it very very hard. Um, all right, are you okay? <laughs>
you okay? Ambiguity is okay. It's okay if you don't get it. It's okay if you don't understand. It's okay, you know, we, we, we don't never ask these questions when we listen to music, right? Like, I don't get it. I don't get this song. I don't, you know, you just feel it, right? And I know a lot of visual artists, you know, when animation started, this is what a lot of filmmakers wanted to do, that they wanted to, they, they created uh, visual movies without sound, right? Because they thought it could create the same thing. And I, and I don't think that, that uh, we know that doesn't really work. But if you put it together, you can create, uh, you know, an even more, uh, elaborate experience, right? And that is that is really what I'm what I'm aiming for, right? Um, again, I don't. It's okay if you don't get it, but you know, and I understand if you're upset, and that's that's fine too. Um, it's okay if you need story, that's fine, um, but I, I'm not going to give it to you. Um, I thought this was interesting. Um, this is a Tarkovsky quote, right? So a book read by a thousand different people is a thousand different books, right? It's it's true, right? If you read a book unless it's turned into a movie, we usually have to make up stuff in our head, right? Um, if a character is described, but we, they don't describe the color of their eyes, we will make that up, right? Um, it, it depends how much of the description is there, but uh, there is a part of us that visualizes it in our head, right? So everybody here will read that book in a different way. There's this beautiful quote in a book about cinema and film, and I can't remember the writer of this, um, or even the title of this book, but was uh, it, it talks about silent films. And in, in, in silent films, um, you know, an actor would speak and then they would put a title card afterwards and we would then uh, see what, uh, read what that actor would say, right? And um, this article or this book, uh, I guess this paragraph um, mused that the moment that silent film became talkies between spoken films is that a million voices died. Right, because before talkies, before when it was films were silent, it was our own voice reading it, and we would make up the sound of that voice. And there was something so poetic about that, where you actually, by giving too much to the audience, you sort of kill a lot of a, a lot of a lot of the inspiration and, and joy, if you will, and also the experience and interaction of the work. Um, so this. I want to abandon story, structure, and syntax. Well, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm doing that, right? Um, I teach it, um, and I like to teach it, and I'd, I want to keep teaching it so I know that I can keep breaking it. Okay, I'm going to end with Bresson, and I'm going to show one more film. Um, because he talks about this, right? I'd rather people feel a film before understanding it, and... Um, I'd rather just people feel it. I don't want you to understand it, or I want you to understand it the way you want to understand it, right? Um, I don't know, there's something really poetic about this, and it's, I feel like I should have watched these films a lot sooner. Um, I don't know, he's a wise man. I feel like he's saying everything that I've said today, or what I want to, what I want to go with, right? Um, art lies in suggestions, so. I want to suggest a shitload, so. All right, uh, I'm gonna show one more film. I made this film 
last year, at the end of 2022, I was working on a feature, and at some point I felt very self-indulgent, because I find it really hard to sit through a feature, and making one, if I can't even sit through one myself, I think was very, was not, wasn't correct, it wasn't right. Um, and so I have like, what, 20 minutes or 25 minutes of this uh, lying on my hard drive, um, and it's, it, I don't know what it's going to be. I was thinking maybe it just needs to be a feature, but I'll treat it as a as a as a long play album, and I'll just bring out the songs like you would do with you know in music, right? So I would send different parts of that uh, film that is a feature as I guess songs uh, from and and send them out to different festivals. Or maybe I should think about it the way you binge a show, right? Binging a show is something that we do. I, bi I can easily watch something eight hours, binge a show for eight hours, or but I cannot always sit through a one and a half hour film, which is very interesting. So I'm trying to figure out what that is. And maybe ne I need to make a binge worthy, worthy uh, I guess, eight hour film. So who knows? Um, but with this film, I really didn't have anything. I wanted to make a film. I wanted to create so badly. And I was burned out, I guess. I really didn't know what to do. And, and I didn't know what I wanted to say. But I did know what I wanted to show. And I figured, well, maybe that's just enough then. And it should be enough, because this is what I'm being talking about, right? So, you know, practice what you preach almost. So I, 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 I had these characters, and um, I was animating them. I was using motion capture data, uh, and compositing it together, um, and, and, and just putting it together in an edit line, right? It's like, without really just feeling when I need to go next, when I need to go next, what needs to go now. And at some point it was like, I'm done. It's one minute and 20 seconds and I'm done. Now I need a soundtrack. <laughs> I usually write all my soundtracks. Um, but for this, I just, I, I, did, I couldn't do it. But I also didn't know what I wanted there. So um, my girlfriend writes also music and I showed her the film and she said, this is lovely. I'm like, yes, but I don't have music. Why don't you score it? Now, I don't, I, I, this is really, I, 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 I usually don't do this. I like to keep control of my pr over my production. So this was, in a way, a paradigm shift as well. I said, well, why don't you find music and, and see what works? And we went through her database. We picked the first song that we picked and we put underneath there. We were high, but it was awesome. And it just totally worked. I'm like, okay, we tried. We know we, we knew we were high, so we, we took we took maybe ten more other songs and put them underneath there. They all kind of worked, but it didn't work like this. And of course, the next day when we were sober and had our coffee, we tried it again, and it still worked. So, I guess in art, it's always go with your first instinct. It's usually true. Or I guess in life, go with your first instinct, right? Um, okay, so um, I'm going to play this film. It's called Wow. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Wow. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Fayez. Um, I think um, <clears throat> we have. I'm not sure how how much more time we have than we than we 
are you know supposed to go to open. happen. No, I think we also start a bit okay. later. Okay. Um. So um. <coughs> I don't know. We probably have about twenty twenty five minutes, something like that. Okay. Um. So if you have any questions, um, comments. Um, please do raise your arm. Um, we do have a microphone here as well, and we can try and make this as much a conversation as possible um, between not just the two of us, but also with you. Um, but I, I would like to sort of um, kick us off with perhaps a l something that could be understood as a suggestive question, but um, I feel like a lot of the things that you talked about um, we're hinting at not just that art is suffering in the sense that making art is suffering, but also that art is suffering um, in, in, in one way or the other. Um, and um, perhaps you can, or we can start this with um, your take on what the point of art is today in the context that we that we live in and the the abundance of images that we are bombarded with every day. Um, okay, art is suffering, yeah. Um, well, what is, it is, what is it to be an artist, right? The idea is that to produce work, to make work. But I think being an artist is not necessarily about being or creating, it's about being an artist being a person that thinks differently about things, that pushes things, that questions things, that is there just having conversations with other people or just being different in that sense. Uh, I know I'm, I, I'm you know, that I don't think I'm particularly different, but if I'm among people that are not artists, right, not here, this is different, this is lovely, right, this is like, this is being home again, then um, you realize that you are an outlier. And people look at you weirdly. You dress weirdly. Why don't you wear a tie? My dad still wonders why I don't wear a tie when I go to work. Right? Um, why don't I show my diploma? I have a master's in engineering, which is, you know, not doing much for me. Right? Um, so, I think this is what it is for me to be an artist. Like this idea that we need to produce, 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 and 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 be successful and be in a gallery or uh, uh, be selected in a film festival. Uh, I mean, all these things are great, right? And, and I think a lot of people would love, you know, a lot of artists would like to be successful and make money. But I don't think that's really what it's about. I mean, it, I mean, if I don't make a lot of money with my work, um, I definitely don't make a living with it. And, um, but that's not why I'm doing it, right? It's like, I, I think, I think that's that's what that is. And, 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 and if you talk about art suffering, I think art is suffering from commerce in that sense, right? Um, yeah, it sounds so, I know, anti-capitalist, but in a, in a way, I think that is sort of what it is. Um, and um, I don't know. It, this is again what happened during the pandemic. It, it was it was very isolating in a way, and I, and 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 it, and it was okay. It was it was. It, I mean, I, I I talk about art is suffering, but what it also means it is also my salvation. It is also something that that is you know it is it, this is a way of life for me, and this is the only way of life for me. And uh, and it's and it's and I feel very blessed, or you know I feel very fortunate that I can do that. So. Um, so I think that's you know that's 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 what I think uh, when it comes to art and suffering and art is suffering. So um, I think one of the one of the reasons why I'm also asking this is um, that I think we when we um, have our deliberations about you know putting a, a program together for the international competition, for example, um, we're we're very often talking about the contract that we have with our audiences um, and. And that is, you know, I mean, basically the contract between curator and, and audience. But then there is also this contract and sort of like invisible contract that you have as an artist with your audience. Um, and that's basically what your work is all about, to, to break that contract and the, the conventions of these contractual situations that we get in. Um, and we often debate, you know, are we an audience festival and what does that even mean? Um, how is that for you? How do you negotiate that um, contractual situation? I mean, you mentioned that you know you don't even expect everyone to understand it. Um, you know, 
a, a blasphemous way of of putting this might also be you, you know you're just lazy you know you can just like say you don't have to understand it you can make of it whatever you want um i don't want to tell you anything about it um well so i do non narrative but figurative art right so people don't ask this for experimental filmmakers right yeah, like it's because it, there's no comprehension to be had or you know it's just like it's like again listening to music right the pro the, the idea is to put things on the screen i i make it figurative because it makes it more complex and more interesting um um of course I'm lazy, I procrastinate all the time. <laughs> but you know, it's like laziness is, I mean, the idea that laziness is a bad thing is not, you know, it's like, I know I read, I mean, I, I guess I way much on the internet, but I saw this quote, and, and I can't remember who it was, but it's like an artist needs to be allowed to make mediocre, shitty work and waste, waste time in order to get better at what he does, or she does, or they do. And I and 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 I and I I I I'm going to have to agree with that because I think that is that is again we go back to, you know, uh, commerce and uh, production and 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 I I produce I produce at least a film a year I I I, I make work because I enjoy making it, um, uh, you know sometimes I think maybe I should make a film like this and maybe then I'll win an award and then after l two days I'm like oh, no, I it, I just it it it's it's so painful. And it's so not what I want to do. Um, so I'm like, yeah, no, it's not happening. You know, I'd rather feel crap and be and make crap than uh, than do something that that doesn't that 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 it goes against my grain in the sense. So. Are there any questions, comments from from your side already at this point? Yes, in the very back. Um, ah, do you think there's something like a sweet spot between showing and leaving out, uh, like the right amount of something? Um no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, I don't think there is. You know, um, you know, a, a great movie cannot be long enough, and a shitty movie cannot be short enough. And yeah, I think again, it depends really on you. There might be some films today that you thought they were way too long. And it might be, you know, maybe all of them were way too long for you, right? Or some of them were too short, right? It's like, I can also not predict that. So I cannot, I don't want to think too much about an audience, right? I am, I am you know, I'm a filmmaker, but I'm also the first audience, right? I'm the first, first person who sees the work. So um, I don't believe in that sweet spot. Or I believe that there's a sweet spot for me, but I don't, necessarily think that is for you but uh, but i also when i'm working on on films like uh, this is the sweet spot let's not let's let's go a little further let's see how far we can push it because i think that is way more interesting being uncomfortable looking at a film like what's happening right y y y instead of watching a film you're, you're 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 watching you're aware that you are watching a film yeah. sorry to cut you off by the way that yes down here speak loud <laughs> uh, so um, how do you think um, like uh, like cultural referencing is important for you this is my first question and my second one is uh, like your protagonists are mostly a uh, woman so like uh, there, there are more boys in this program than women okay so <laughs> but, uh, well like we can talk about that if you want Okay, uh, like uh, how do you uh, come out of the skin of a man and, you know, uh, what does it take for you to do that? What does it take for me to use these characters, y you mean? Like, uh, come out of the, uh, ma m like, portray yourself as a uh, woman character. Okay, all right, okay. So, you want to do the, you want to do the diversity first? Yeah? Yeah. Um, Yeah. 
it, this is the thing, right? If you're a diverse person, you're supposed to make work that is diverse, right? Or that's, you know, so you're, 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 um, you need to address your minority-ness, right? Which is, no, that's not happening. You know, it's like, if, why do I have to make a film about my ethnicity because I'm not white, right? So I'm not doing that. Um, I'm, I, th this is me, this is all, it, everything is me, right? The characters and male and female characters. I used to use a lot more female characters and naked and full frontal. And, um, you know, I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of shit for that, right? And then the thing is, uh, to me, one, nudity is, uh, or, n you know, being, n nudity is for me something very natural. It doesn't really uh, make me uncomfortable. And it's something that I find you know, I, f I find it liberating, and um, I've, I've made I've made a film about myself suffering from this neurological disorder, and it was a naked woman, and I never questioned why I, w I, I put that there, and it's I, I'm I'm not a woman, I you know I I might be ambiguous about how I, what I identify with completely, right, um, but it to me I don't know it's like it was not until people started challenging me on that like. I don't know why th that is a woman because it is me, and all these characters are me. They all look like me. Some of them, you know, have male genitalia, some female genitalia. But to me, they're all me. So I always feel like I'm I'm bearing myself naked here. Um, I'm actually the feature that I'm working on. Uh, I'm actually featuring myself in there without clothes because that's only fair because my characters are also naked. So um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, something that I that I find quite interesting um, is in, in reference to the to the film um, this ain't Disneyland in a way is that your films obviously they play with with phenomenon that uh, um, you know are pop re pop reference uh, or pop culture references um, but in that sense also news uh, references and um i think there's there's been a lot of studies done um but also a lot of academic writing i mean judith butler writes about this a, a lot it's like the the way that images um perpetuate pain but also um depending on how often you see them you you sort of get numbed by them um so how how is that for you? How do you relate your work to exactly these images that we see every day that serve a certain purpose or are supposed to serve a certain purpose, um, but you're reappropriating them in in this case in a very sp of a sp very specific event? Well, well, uh, but this in Disneyland is very specific in that sense. It's really just a direct reflection of my exp or you know a, a, a visual or an illustration of my perception of what happened and. And so yeah, there's it, there's a lot of repetition. It's cut pretty fast, right? You can see in the older films there's a lot more editing and film grammar, if you will, in there. Um, and this film, I mean, I talked about these 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 pop references, right? Um, the news is also is is as much entertainment as Star Wars is, right? That, 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 that there is, it's 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 as much fiction as it is true fiction, right? So to me, it. You know, I guess in this case it was really just that, um, this is what I needed to get out of my system. It took me a couple of years to get it out of my system, and when I made it, I'm like, yeah, this is what I need to do. This film took took a lot longer than I wanted to, and um, at the very end, um, that that the ending there where re everything goes in reverse and uh, my two kids are singing, that came I think the day before I was supposed to. Uh, this was commissioned before I had to submit it, and. Um, what I really hated about the film was that it end had a happy ending. Because I remember it wasn't a happy ending. What I really hated about what was happening in the United States, like, yes, everything is okay, it's like, you know, we're gonna build another tower, hey ho, let's go, it's all good. And it wasn't, everything fucking changed. The world was never, this. Is, it has not been the same. I mean, it's been such a dramatic shift in, 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 in how the world functions and the dynamics, etc. cetera. And, um, I make these films at home, and a lot of times I don't have. I, I usually don't have a studio. Um, I, I work in a bedroom, or I, I work in a living room, and my kids are running around with me. They, you know, 
know, they're older now, but they, they, they were always aware of what I was making. They would, you know, my son would come sit in the morning with me and we would look at the renders that I did overnight. Um, and so with this film, they were, you know, like, oh, this is Disneyland and it's Disneyland and they were singing, they're, they're, you know, they're singing in the beginning too. They were singing, it's a whole, it's a whole new world, right? Um, but they started bastardizing this, like children this. And my son started saying, it's a whole new world and nobody cares. And I was like, that is it. That is so brilliant. And he was like, he was this high. Um, and he was singing it like just around the hall. And it's like, Sky, you have, to you have to record this for me. Can you please do it? Can you write it down with your sister? So he and his sister, um, they wrote down the lyrics and then we recorded it and we put it in there. And it's like, it sounds so evil and nagging. And it's exactly what it was. The world was upside down. Nobody cared, but the world was never the same anymore. And so, I don't know, for me, I don't think this is the answer to your question at all, actually, but I'm, I'm, go I'm going a bit on a tangent here. Um, <clears throat> but it's really, um, you know, these the perpetuation in that film was, or, or the repetition was d done deliberately. It is supposed to be numbing you. It's supposed to be like you don't see it anymore. You don't. You just start looking at maybe the fantasticness, uh, the fantastical things of the smoke and and and, and the destruction and and etc. So, I think that is. In that film, that that's really what that was about. I don't think I would make that film right now. I don't think I would make a film like that anymore. But who knows? So. Yes, there's a question down here. Um, okay, um, I can imagine that you get a lot less critical questions like what is it about and I don't get it in like the actual artwork compared to cinema because people are much more used to things not making sense and not everything being spelled out so my question would be did you ever consider only showing your works in like I don't know museum or gallery context or is it something that you actually um, look after as well I've done that I've, I've had it in galleries and stuff um, but I like the idea of having it in a cinema and having other people experience it with each other and get uncomfortable next to each other, right? Because um, I think that it, that is that is that is the beauty of it. I think. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. You'll get. You'll, it's way more acceptable to do something like that. You know, it's 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 conceptual or whatever whatever the word for it is, right? Um, I know it's it's there's something about galleries that that is so elitist in a way, and uh, it there's some it's, it's it sort of feel like there's a gate that people have to jump over to get into that. A cinema is still it's still you know it's popular entertainment, right? And so I I feel it's more f it, it's it's a way more interesting playing ground for me. So, but that sorry, but but that but that's interesting because I think uh, in 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 some of the articles or or, or essays that you write, um, you say that. Um, art is not supposed to be entertaining. No, it's not supposed to be entertaining. No, that's true. Well, not per se. Um, you know, it's like, it's. It, I mean, yeah, I, th the idea that you go and watch a film and you need to be entertained is that's 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 not what that is about. I want you, you know, it, I'd rather you think about something or get uncomfortable or super comfortable. Or you just, you just, you know, you just, you just, you just, f you fall in this cloud of, 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 of visual bliss for yourself. I think that's way more interesting than than being entertained. I mean, I know film is entertainment, but so is art, so is life, so is sex, so is alcohol, so is food. <coughs> this is all joy and entertainment, right? But yeah, it, it, I, I don't strive to be entertaining, no. And it's okay, you don't, ha you don't, you don't have to like it. That's, you know, that's, that's totally fine. You, you, that, you, know, you can walk out of the film, it's fine. Um, I'd rather you be angry uh, or 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 elated by the work than just be meh about it. So, you know. And I think w what what makes a cinema such a such a pertinent place for this is that you kind of can't escape it. Um, I mean, you can. You, I mean, you can always leave, and it happens often enough in in, in festival contexts that people leave. But um, as a as a space, it's it's dark. Right, you're you're supposed to sit. You like if people start looking at their phones, other people get annoyed, um, and and in that sense, coming back to you know your your initial topic of time and and slowness and the idea of you know n nothing happening basically, um, and you wandering around the screen, um, 
it feels like the cinema is actually the space for this to happen because even in a gallery, it's very easy to get distracted by every either everyone around you or the, the other you know exhibits that that are there. Yeah, it, th that's absolutely true. If if you would put it in a in a cine in, in in a gallery, it is you know it it becomes a m it becomes an animated painting or a moving painting, which I find a very interesting. I find that very interesting as well, uh, but. That is not really what this is. This, and I, and I think you're right about it. B putting it in a cinema and sitting down there, you, you as the audience, make the decision to sit and stay, right? You can always walk away, right? You have that agency, but you sitting there in the dark, and it's also it's dark, so nobody can see you. There is a you have a there's also a privacy within your head there, right? And you can go and wander around um, instead of just all you know being dictated to uh, what to uh, what to experience next and to see next and what to look at next so more questions yes uh oh <laughs> it's just a technical question don't be afraid <laughs> <laughs> no, come on andre <laughs> Maybe it's um, due to the selection of your films, but I had the feeling that you're much more interested now in fabrics and uh, tactile tactility or tactile quality because of the dancer. Uh, th there's this moving dress. Usually you have very sterile uh, surfaces and also the last one is uh, very grainy. So you have really, yeah, more like a, like an accidental thing. Yeah, that I, I guess this is the one thing that I didn't really speak about. Uh, but um, you can see in, I guess, in Bit Hello Bambi, that's very controlled. Like the surfaces are very plastic and controlled. And it's really just celebrating this, like, sort of anti CGI aesthetic, which, or this, this aesthetic of hiding so hardly that, so badly that we're using CGI. So uh, that's, that's really what that was about. But um, I think what, it's, it's a two way thing. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's the texture on "Are You Okay" of the dress is basically a texture that went wrong. It's not supposed to. It was supposed to be stuck, but it wasn't. And it's you know, it was supposed to be be, be stuck to the move to the to the character, but it's actually that she's moving through the structure. And I thought that was awesome, so I just went with it. And and so it also feels like um, I'm, I'm sort of letting it go a little bit. I'm, I'm I'm letting go of control of the work a lot more. And um, I, I'm also extremely impatient, so I'm rendering at, at much lower quality at the moment. I'm rendering so, uh, like preview modes, uh, and that's also why it becomes so grainy. But it's so beautiful, you know. It's like why um, instead of like doing like hardcore renders that take an hour for a frame, this goes a lot faster and it's so much more satisfying. And but, but yeah, I, I think the, I think that the, the the I guess the, the the texture of it is something that I I'm really starting to embrace a lot more, and I'm letting go because I don't have control over over texture. I don't have that control, uh, so there's a lot happening uh, outside of my control. Yeah, I'm, I'm using motion capture data. Um, I, I, I I use I, a lot of times I write soundtracks that are just driven by algorithms, right? Uh, instead of me writing actually uh, music, uh, I just let the algorithms uh, generate beats and what have you. Um, and I and, and I guess that is uh, I guess that all that that's what happened during during the pandemic. It's okay. It's okay to let go, right? Um, I think it becomes more of a dialogue between me and my, my and, and, my, and my medium. So, um, but yeah, I, you're right. <laughs> what do you What do you do in the in the time that you gain from working that way? I'm just more procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> How are we? Yes, there, there's, there's another question. Okay, I'm going to use the word that I'm not allowed to use. Um, but um, since you like working with algorithms, have you experimented with AI? Um, I've done, I've done my daughter's homework in ChatGPT. We've, r we've written book reports because they were so stupid that we did it in ChatGPT. Um, I mean, I, c I, I, I haven't really used it. I, I did this once, like create art by Fayaz Jaffrey, and I get pictures of Middle Eastern men. I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> like, I guess I'm not important <laughs> enough yet, or ubiquitous enough to be part of that. Um, I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I have nothing against it. I think it's 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 very interesting, but um, I don't need it. I don't feel the need to use AI. You know, it's like, uh, um, and it's, I'm pretty sure it's going to get better and going to do. Ama you know, it's. It, it's you know there's I don't know we we just have the cusp of this so I don't know but um, 
I, me personally, I'm not yet interested in it, in, in, in using it. So. <laughs> I think we've got time for one or two more questions, if you will. Yes. Hey, thanks a lot for everything so far. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about relating to pop culture, how you're using devices which are kind of non-conventional, with, without narrative, with near archetypes and things like this. I think fundamentally every film at its base has an idea which it's trying to convey in some essence. The filmmaker is trying to express themselves in some way, but and that will be interpreted in many different ways, as you pointed out, but fundamentally it will always be drawn back to the filmmaker. And I was wondering if we're using or trying to create media using popular devices because we want that content to be consumed by more people and to be more popular, do you think in a way that's kind of being inauthentic as an artist that you're not quite using the most appropriate media form to express yourself, but you're going for kind of popular choice instead? Um. I don't think I understand. You're talking about the software that I use, or you're talking about me using a phone instead of a high-end camera? More like, do you think you've been more authentic to yourself by choosing this um, this way of portraying your media instead of more popular methods? Um, I think I've been pretty true to myself in that sense. Um, I started using computers in in the 80s, I guess, and I started making art very quickly with it. And um, I was always extremely annoyed with, you know, uh, when Photoshop came out, the first thing that people did was not use Photoshop for what it was unique for. There was a Van Gogh filter on it, and everybody made a Van Gogh of their own picture that they scanned in. And I was like, what is the fucking point? I'm sorry. And I was like, I was so appalled by that. Right, and then then we have now we we have these beautiful uh, computers, and the only thing we're using it for to really hide the fact that we're using a computer. Like uh, ninety percent of the films out there use CGI, but we don't see it. I want to see it go wrong. I want to I want to you know I want I uh, as a comparison I want to see the brush stroke. I want to smell the paint. I want to touch it. Right, and so when it comes to CGI, I want I want that to happen. Am I pure to my medium? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Uh, I will never hide that fact. None of these films are perfect. They slip and slide. The walk cycles are not perfect, right? The 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 the, the exploding buildings. The uh, I could have fixed the way that these things break. I think some of these building parts keep moving around. I don't. You know, it's like this is the splatter on the wall that I don't want to take away. To me, it's always been about digital materiality and you know, celebrating that medium and finding a new aesthetic, right? And I'm not the only one. There's a there's a vast amount of 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 of, of fine artists that are using it uh, f f in that same in that same mode, right? It's, it's I'm not interested in a Pixar aesthetic, and I'm not interested in that. So I don't know if that's that answers your question, but um, yeah, I think I am. It does. Thank you very much. Um, then uh, exactly on that note, I mean, this this is also something that um, is very much connected to to film history in a way. Do you do you see yourself working within the wake of a certain um, evolution of filmmaking? I mean, there was this movement, you know, about the imperfection of cinema in the in the sixties, um, where it is exactly about everything that you're saying. It's like you people are supposed to see that this is a film, that it, this is manufactured, um, that you're breaking all these all these stereotypes. Do you see yourself working in this? Because, and that back then, obviously, this was this was a political movement. Um, yeah, I think so. I, th I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I, th I guess I'm becoming more radical in that sense. I would fix things a lot more than I do now. Like, oh, this looks in preview mode, fine. Let's just go with it. I like the noise. Let's just do it. Or it's not that even I like the noise. This is this is this is true. Right? This is you know. It's like I don't need to go with a higher render. Um, this is what it looks like. It looks digital. It looks dirty, digitally dirty. I'm gonna go with that. So, um, and uh, you know, it's like I don't know. This is what artists always do. They def you know th th there's there's a new medium out there, or and you know, and and an artist will use it in a way that it was not supposed to be used. Um, and and I. 
that is what I that is what I what I'm doing is not not original in that sense. Every artist does that, right? And um, I like to I like to perpetuate it. I mean, that, I mean, you know, it's like I, I'm talking about Deleuze and I'm talking about Schrader and I'm talking about Tarkovsky and and, and you know I mean Chantal Ackermann. I mean, I didn't talk about Chantal Ackermann today, which I really should have, but um, you know. It, 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 I didn't know about these artists until I started making films like that. I mean, it's not completely, I knew about them, right? But then I, I, I didn't, the discourse was for me not something that I was, I, I wasn't reading it, I wasn't uh, studying it. And it's like, well, this makes total sense. I've been doing this all along. I mean, it was not until, um, I guess a couple of years ago when I started writing about my work, I'm like, Jesus, I'm a total postmodernist. I'm like, of course I am. I was born in the 80s, you know, it's like, or in the 60s, but I grew up in the 80s. Everything I do is completely postmodern. It's a complete bricolage. It's, it's a galacticism full on, you know. It's like, I'm, I'm old in that sense. So, I don't know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a product of my time and, uh, and I, I get swayed by, uh, by what's going on in the world. I just let it, let it I, you know, I, just let, I absorb it and sponge it and it just comes out in some other kind of way and it's, it's all good. It's just, it's just me putting my putting my guts out there, um, because what else can I do? And I'm and I'm sure this 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 comes with time that you um, are you know becoming more and more comfortable to do that. Yes, and then also, and I guess to end on that note, you also then take more time, and time is okay to waste, and it's okay to take your time to get there. Well, it took quite a while to get here, um, but in a very good way, um, for me anyway, and I hope for you too. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your presentation, for all your insights into your work and your uh, way of working also, and for, for um, yeah, just sharing your, your thoughts with us um, this afternoon. Um, there is one day and just a tiny bit more left of Finfas Dress in this year. Uh, more films to watch, obviously, tonight, the award ceremony, where you will also have to be yet again on duty. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to um, what you've made of all the films that you've seen. Um, perhaps they were too long, per perhaps they were too short. Um, who knows? Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Good luck for tonight. And um, enjoy the rest of this uh, sunny Saturday. <laughs>